This video is my contribution to a larger collaboration with eight other YouTube channels. We've all come together to explore themes of privation, trauma, and struggle in military history prior to the First World War. Because all too often, while we may recognize these things in more modern and contemporary history, the further back in time you go, the more romanticized, the more mythologized military history often becomes. But even when soldiers were you know, wearing cool sets of armor and, uh, and colorful uniforms, the inclusion of flags and music in the battlefield could never change the simple reality of what warfare is. And that is organized mass killing. Sometimes for good, yes, but often not. Whatever its causes, or its means, or the time in which it was waged, war is, and has always been, hell for those who experience it. So when you're finished watching this video, click on the playlist down below to see the others in this series, ranging from uh, ancient Rome all the way up to the late Victorians. Uh, you'll probably recognize plenty of the channels there already, and I hope that you find a few new ones to enjoy as well. Uh, and before we do get started, this video will both show and describe some disturbing imagery, including severe battlefield injuries and death. If you have a particularly sensitive stomach, you may not want to watch or listen to this video. And if you are a younger person, please, I would recommend having an adult you trust to look over this video first to check if it is appropriate for you. Thank you, and now we can begin. Historical films are often terrible, and historical war movies are usually even worse. How many times have we seen long lines of heroes marching to ridiculously over-the-top music that makes it sound noble as they fall like martyrs without a single drop of blood to show for it? And of course, if there ever is a little bit of red dye involved, how it's usually being clutched strongly by a man as he gasps out those last few noble words while a sad, tragic piano theme is playing in the background. How many times have we seen romantic idealism, poetic tragedy, take over these war films to the point that they make it feel more like an adventure than anything else? Adventures have sad moments, to be sure, but they are still adventures, are they not? War should never be an adventure film. Battle scenes shouldn't make you feel happy, proud, or even sad in any traditional way, uh, like the death of a main character might. Above any other emotion, above it all, a true portrayal of battle should make you feel anxious. It can make you feel proud, maybe, or delight because, you know, the good side is winning or something, but it should also make you feel uncomfortable, even disgusted. War on the big screen should feel like a horror film made all the worse because it's real. It's not just some slasher film, it's real events, real people, real suffering. Today I'd like to discuss one such portrayal from the 2016 film The Free State of Jones. As a Civil War battle, it's meant to show the Second Battle of Corinth in 1862. Uh, now, it isn't necessarily the best, I admit, in terms of material culture. Uh, there, it could really use some work. Uh, there are plenty of pedantic little details, like the commands and the uniforms, blah, 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 uh, that we could all pick out. And, and absolutely, if they got those details correct, it would have made the scene absolutely um, uh, improved. It would have made it better. But ultimately, as well, those things... They're not what really matters in the wider scale. They don't matter anywhere near as much as the things that the scene does well and what I want to talk about in this video. So before I even show you the scene, I want you to listen to it. Pay attention to the sound design here. Really give it time to move through you and see if it doesn't evoke any particular feelings. Uh, we'll start off with the opening advance as the army is moving across the field to the front. Close that rank. Steady, boy. Steady. What do you notice? All pervasive boots pounding on flattened earth, the heavy breathing, the monotonous cries of the steps slowly becoming more strained as the soldiers march. We don't have any heroic speeches, merely the guidance of officers. There's no swelling music, just the distant, deep, guttural rolling of artillery. It is a deeply personal approach uh, to the sound design that's bringing the audience into the formation, and it's helping us to feel that same apprehension of what is about to come. Very few scenes will have so many noises happening all at once, such complex sound design, and yet 
feel so quiet and so lonely all at once. Now let's come to the battle itself, just a brief portion of it when the firing begins. Some reused scream effects do lessen the impact, I admit, but still, what we don't have here is swelling music and heroic entreaties and speeches to, you know, keep on marching boys, old Virginia, blah 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 blah, to that same heroic music. What soundtrack there is, is little more than a few slow tones to emphasize that which we are already feeling. And through it all, those same footsteps, the heavy breathing, it's keeping us in that column with the army as Manet balls are falling and, and blowing past all around us. Now finally, let's listen in on what happens later on in the scene as we follow a stretcher bearer to the rear of the lines and to a field hospital. Yep. They got Ethan. That sickening slicing of saw into flesh, orders and calls for aid laid over top of pain, screaming interspersed with prayers over the dying. No dramatic death speeches, no appeal to the audience to understand just how tragic it all was. Just the dirty, visceral reality of that horrible place. It's allowing the hospital to speak for itself. We don't have to have the character lay there and talk about how upset he is that he's not going to be able to go back home, blah, blah, blah. No, we don't need any of that. It's allowing the place to speak for itself. There is no reprise and there is no comfort for the audience. Visceral, real, anxiety, tension, helplessness, and sorrow alongside all of that disgust. Through a limited application of music and a greater emphasis on those visceral, more grounded sound effects, the film is able to build up a deeply personal feeling to this battle scene. Like I said, it doesn't send the audience high above the clouds to watch the battle as unfold as some you know, epic struggle beneath them. It brings us down into the mud where a battle isn't grand, it's chaotic, and it's frightening. But there is more to filmmaking than just sound design. What about the visuals of the scene? Do they convey these same messages working with the sound? Absolutely, they do. Our first sight is of a mass of booted feet tramping over bodies. Dirty, stony faces staring ahead as officers keep the formation together. Between the terrified stares of the men, we see the vacant gazing of corpses. The camera is unsteady to accompany the sound of breathing to again make us feel like we really are in that line marching alongside the men as we slowly come up over the ridge to witness the enemy army rising up out of the ground. And when battle begins, it is immediate, it's sudden, almost like a jump scare. The officer there, in any other film, you know he'd be waving his sword and treating his men, giving long speeches to that same swelling music before eventually us being, oh, tragically cut down and embracing his lieutenant, who also, of course, happens to be his brother, and giving that long-winded speech about his mother and blah blah blah. Well, the battle's waging behind them, but no, no, we're not gonna focus on the battle. We're gonna focus on this man's slowly, slowly dying, uh, you know, as appropriate for the plot. But here... War is never that clean. War is never that polite. War is never that patient. The officer is hit and instantly killed, his head bursting open like a melon. Funnily enough, I feel like this YouTube comment that's posted on the scene really actually captures the moment really quite well. The user writing, months of anxiety, build up and preparation, all of your blood, sweat, tears invested into reaching this one moment in life and Bam! Just like that, it's done. No closure, no knowledge on whether your sacrifice was in vain or if, if your troops carry the day, no last words for your mother or your sweetheart. We don't get any time to process the man's death. The column simply moves on and the iron hail begins to fall 
amongst them. We never see much of the actual battle, but we do see some of its most terrible devices at play. Artillery firing shot and shell into the densely packed formations cuts them down and mass, spraying those surrounding with blood. No sooner had our men fallen back than there came a portion of the Confederate soldiers dashing past me, panic-stricken and huddled together like sheep, presenting elegant marks for the grape and cannonballs which cut paths through them and hurled them writhing and digging into the mud and water of the swamp. One man, in his haste to get out of danger, shoved me on one side, and just at the instant a canister shot tore his head off and spattered my face with his blood and brains. Overall, the scene could have done with more gore to fully capture the reality of this situation like they did with the officer's head, but at the least we don't get any over-the-top explosions with men ragdolling ten feet into the air before landing again without any drop of blood or gore or anything. Uh, they're just mangled. Uh, maybe they're thrown a little bit this way and that by the force of minae balls and chunks of shrapnel hitting them before they fall straight down to the ground, as it should be. So, as explosions rack the air and men step over their dead and dying, we leave the line as if wounded ourselves to witness battle's terrible results. Wretched corpses litter the field. Any thoughts of glory, whether theirs or ours as the audience, are now decaying on the cold and lonely ground. Much like the earlier officer, we have had the build-up of impending battle, but we never see it. We never receive that payoff, that rush of adrenaline that comes with battle. As the line forges on, we are left alone with the corpses and our thoughts, our anxiety. There were men with their arms and legs and hands shot off, bodies torn up, features distorted and blackened. There was one poor devil with his back broken, trying to pull himself along by his hands, dragging his legs after him to get out of the cornrows, which the last night's rain had filled with water. Another, with both legs shot off, was trying to steady the mangled trunk against a gun stuck in the ground. So once again, the only issue is that the film isn't going far enough. It needs more gore, more wounded desperation. The deaths here are simply too clean looking, although those issues do not last long. And soon enough, we are once again pulled down into the mud to meet one cold set of eyes lingering over this. Next comes one of the two most poignant and most horrifying images in this scene, and, to be sure, the most real as well. It is not glorious. It doesn't feel very heroic or noble. As we are given time to gaze into that single dead eye on the edge of a horrendous gap where once was a face, with buzzing flies our only sign of life, any sane person can feel nothing but disgust a repulsive, sorrowful sickness that sits deep in the stomach. The disorganization of tissue produced by a little conical bullet is indeed wonderful. In dissecting some of the limbs I amputated at the late Battle of Fredericksburg, I was curious enough to count the number of fragments of bone. Their average number was between 20 and 30, while portions of the bone were ground to powder, described one medical professional on the effects of minae balls on the human body, while the regimental history of the 19th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry listed one man's unfortunate, yet by no means rare, fate when John Barry of Company C was severely wounded in the face by a minae ball, which completely destroyed one half of the upper jaw and took off a piece of his nose. And then, after our disgust, comes remorse regret, and indeed the sadness we are perhaps most accustomed to in scenes like this, although here, again, much more real. As we are reminded that even as these men in particular fought for the wrong cause, even as justice and human dignity demanded their defeat, still, they loved, and they were loved, they were humans, and they did not die in their homes, surrounded by love, as many in this period were wont to do, but alone mangled and in pain, clutching at memories as they bled out alone in the field. And with that memory, we leave the battle, coming to our main character, a stretcher bearer, as he pulls one wounded boy away from one hellish circle to another. We still hear the guns in the background, the occasional shell exploding overhead as columns of troops are moving into position, while the stretcher is navigating the broken terrain. 
He attempts to comfort the casualty as they pass a brutalized environment of burning trees, broken carriages, and shell holes full of corpses. One such corpse, long forgotten as the lines of battle have shifted, is actively being devoured by wild hogs, its innards strewn outwards. It's a brief scene that doesn't allow us to see much, but those awful wet sounds of gnashing teeth, the slight nudging of the body as snouts delve deeper into the intestines, it's genuinely sickening. And while admittedly I can't imagine this sort of thing being all too common you know, during the actual engagement instead of after the fact, I'm still really glad that they included this where they, just wherever they could at least, because this kind of thing, this sight, was terrifyingly common during the American Civil War. In his book, Perryville Under Fire, Stuart W. Sanders describes this disgusting reality, quote, Battlefield searchers and the wounded were most concerned about hogs that roamed the field. Before the Confederates left Perryville, they hastily built pens to protect their comrades' corpses from farm animals. Many of the soldiers, likely fearing that their bodies could someday share the same fate, vividly recalled these pens. Mead Holmes noted, we passed a cornfield of eight acres, almost covered with pens made of rails and covered with straw. These are filled with dead rebels. The piled fence rails were not enough to protect the dead from the free-ranging hogs that rooted up shallow graves and ate unburied bodies. Charles Francis of the 88th Illinois Infantry was appalled when he saw several dead Confederates surrounded by rails. This was done, Francis remarked, so as to protect the remains from being attacked by the swine that prowled in the woods. The disgusting sight of these animals feeding upon human gore was more than sufficient to give them immunity from sacrifice by the hungry of our army. No one could be found sufficiently hardy to talk of eating of the flesh of hogs captured near the battlefield. No, no more than if we were an army of Hebrews. There were not enough pens to protect all the bodies. The day after the fight, a member of Rousseau's staff commented that the swine now held possession of the field. Seven days later, another Union officer informed his wife that the battleground was the most horrid sight that ever man beheld. Today there are hundreds of men being eaten up by the buzzards and hogs. A member of the 81st Indiana told the New Albany Daily Ledger, In one place lay a wounded rebel too helpless to move, and near him lay one of his dead comrades with the top of his head blown off and hogs eating his body, the wounded men unable to drive them away. Do you see how this is more horror than adventure? For there is nothing poetic in severed piles of gore being devoured by pigs while wounded friends are attempting to shoo them away. It's no wonder that the stretcher bearer here has such a crazed look in his eyes as he's navigating this environment. Now, as to the hospital scene, I don't feel the need to go through it with quite the same thoroughness as it is much more self-explanatory and I'd rather focus on accounts of the battlefield itself for this video. After all, every war film will have a frightening hospital scene. It seems to be the one time they're allowed to actually acknowledge that war can be bad. Now, there's really no good place for me to put a commercial in this kind of video. But I'm going to do it anyways. This video is brought to you by the Native Oak and particularly a new poster design that if you've enjoyed this video so far, you may be interested in. Uh, this one's about the 18th century. Now, 18th century battlefields are often portrayed in much the same way as neat, tidy, uh, poetic, even glorious affairs. But that is not war. This is not the reality of thousands of redcoats in June of 1775. This is not the Battle of Bunker Hill. This is. On the outskirts of a burning town, marching three times through broken country against fortified rebels being cut down in their lines and littering the field with bloodied corpses and the wounded, this is the hell of 18th century warfare. This is the Battle of Bunker Hill. This poster is inspired by a piece that you might recognize, uh, Thomas Leia's The 2000 Yard Stare, and I hope that it might serve as a reminder that trauma, even if it went unrecognized in the past, is not a new development, and that war is, and indeed always has been, hell. 
This piece was commissioned from the fantastic artist Mr. Manuel Kromenacher, who has a wide assortment of 18th and 19th century inspired military artwork. If you'd like to see more of his work, you can find his information in the description down below. And of course, if you are interested in purchasing this poster and supporting both myself and the artist, you can find the poster's two variations, one with bottom text and one without, at nativeoak.org forward slash shop. Thank you all as ever for your time and your support, and now we may return to the American Civil War. There is nothing fun about this scene, and nothing adventurous or exciting. It's scary, it's anxiety inducing, and it's outright disgusting. That's what war is, what it always has been. All too often, films show conflict, even tragic conflict, in beautiful, romantic, and idealized fashion, all in the name, people will claim, of the art of filmmaking and of telling a good story. Well, high art and epic storytelling are all well and good, but having real warfare stand as nothing more than a representation of individual characters uh, can go by another name as well whitewashing, sanitizing that which is inherently unclean. But hold on. Just a minute, you may be thinking to yourself, sure, yes, war has a lot of awful moments. We all know that, but that doesn't mean that a film has to be nonstop doom and gloom and gray filters for it to be accurate. There was levity in war. There was joy. Indeed, a significant number of men not only enjoyed their service, but actively found a sort of solace in combat. War, it might be said, was something that gave meaning to many of these men's lives, where previously none had existed. Union officer John W. DeForest explained that to fire at a person who is firing at you is somehow wonderfully consolatory and sustaining. More than that, it is exciting and produces in you the so-called joy of battle. Although DeForest described the comfort of shooting in self-defense, he also revealed how he escaped an oppressive sense of victimhood through action against his enemy. He was at once justified and empowered by battle's intensity. So writes uh, Drew Gilpin Faust in her book, This Republic of Suffering, Death and the American Civil War. She continues, Frank Coker of Georgia tried to explain to his wife how, despite battle's horrors, there's an excitement, a charm, an inspiration in it that makes one wish to be where it's going on. For some men from rural areas, battle took on the character of the hunt with its sense of sport and pleasure. A Texas officer exulted as his enemies fell before him. Oh, this is fun to lie here and shoot them down. And to a Union soldier near Harrison's Landing, Virginia in 1862, battle seemed like play, for we would be laughing and talking to each other while yelling and firing away. One fellow would say, watch me pop that fellow. Another fellow said, I dropped a six foot sea sesh. Jeering at the enemy, laughing in battle, meaning and empowerment through combat? Well, yes, such things are possible, common even. Battle itself was by no means nothing but Game of Thrones style misery. It was driven by adrenaline, by excitement, and a lot of the accounts reflect that. So shouldn't our media also reflect that? Perhaps even resounding choruses and heroic moments might be appropriate when the men themselves are describing how exciting and even enjoyable it could be at times, how euphoric, perhaps, that moment of triumph was? Well, there's a fine line, I think, between demonstrating that particular aspect of hell and engaging with it. And do not get me wrong, even as those men are laughing at dropping a six-foot sea sesh, it's equally as worthy of the horror genre, that, that scene, as any other. A Clockwork Orange's notorious rape scene, you will recall, features a great deal of laughing at the victim, merely because individuals are finding delight and some strange form of therapeutic catharsis in their killing, does not suddenly make the event light-hearted. If anything, it is evidence all the stronger of how war might twist and even break even the greatest of us. It is well and fine for films to demonstrate this element of human nature, to show the sportsmanlike attitude soldiers might take, and even to celebrate the genuine heroics and the noble virtues, yes, which warfare does, do, can and does bring out. 
But these same films ought never to engage with such things while ignoring their inherent after effects, while sanitizing the actions to make them more palatable. Because while one side may be laughing at hitting a particularly large target, on the other side, a man has lost his face. A man is drowning in his own blood. A man is clutching at a locket, wishing he might have had the chance to say goodbye. Films must never celebrate the good while ignoring the bad. And that dichotomy, that juxtaposition, is again part of what makes war so hellish. While a film can show, you know, whatever it likes, it's possible for a film to, you know, dip and dive and jump wherever it wants to, its subjects, the real soldiers of these historic battles, they didn't have a choice but to be left with the gruesome remains of their peculiar art. And when the battle ended, they were always left to reconcile its results. They couldn't jump away from the battlefields to another scene on the home front. They had to sit there with it. Of all the horrors, the horrors of the battlefield are the worst. And yet when you're in the midst of them, they don't appall one as it would seem they ought. You're engrossed with the struggle and see one and another go down and say, there goes poor so-and-so, will it be my turn next? Your losses and dangers don't oppress you till afterwards when you sit down quietly to look over the result or go out with details to bury the dead. Colonel Luther Bradley, Union Army. Even still, I understand some people were just different. Whether learned or by nature, some did delight in it all. Uh, perhaps they hid their breaking psyches behind shields of duty, honor, national pride, or perhaps it wasn't hiding it at all. Perhaps they were earnest in their belief and their enjoyment. That doesn't make it any less horrifying as well. I rode over the battlefield and enjoyed the sight of hundreds of dead Yankees, saw much of the work I had done in the way of several limbs, decapitated bodies, and mutilated remains of all kinds, doing my soul good, would that the whole Union Army or as such, and I had had my hand in it. Osmond Latrobe, Confederate artillery officer after the Battle of Antietam. And of course, in struggles such as the American Civil War, where hatred and fear both mixed so readily in purely innocent traits such as color, it was easy for many men to become corrupted and find complacency or even delight in that same terror, in that same horror. But that can never make evil any less terrible, however delightful some men may find it. Again, if anything, it merely makes it worse. I never saw so many dead Negroes in my life. We took no prisoners except the white officers, 14 in number. These we lined up and shot after the Negroes were finished. Next day they were thrown into a wagon, hauled to the river, and thrown in. Some were hardly dead, but that made no difference. In they went, wrote one Texas officer after a battle in Monroe, Louisiana. And if even after all of that, I have still not convinced you that war films should always feel more like horror than adventure, I will leave you with two more quotes. Quotes that Seriously, they sound as if they are coming out of Lovecraftian, Cronenbergian, body horror, slasher movie type stuff. And remember that when that artillery officer described enjoying his day's work, these were the sorts of environments that he was moving through. Not just vast fields of men lying as if asleep. The reality is always far more visceral than that. The first of these quotes comes again from Republic of Suffering. Unable to explain, soldiers tried to describe, invoking the raw physicality of carnage and suffering. Even as survivors, they could not escape the literal touch of death which assaulted the senses. First, there was the smell. The dead and dying actually stink upon the hills, W.D. Rutherford wrote his wife after the Seven Days Battle around Richmond. For a radius of miles, the mephitic effluvia caused by rotting bodies ensured that even if the dead were out of sight, they could not be out of mind. And then there were the thousands of bodies. Men had become putrefied meat, not so much killed as slaughtered, with nothing to distinguish them from so many animals. Stepping accidentally on a dead man's leg felt to James Wood Davidson's boot touch like a piece of pickled pork, hard and yet fleshy, and he leapt back with alarm. Soldiers looked with horror upon bodies that seemed to change color as they rotted, commenting frequently upon a transformation that must have had considerable significance in a society and a war in which race and skin color were of definitive importance. 
The faces of the dead, one northern Gettysburg veteran described, as a general rule had turned black, not a purplish discoloration such as I had imagined in reading of the blackened corpses so often mentioned in descriptions of battlegrounds, but a deep bluish black, giving to the corpse with black hair the appearance of a negro. The second account is a more direct one from a soldier's memoirs who managed to become lost and was attempting in a particularly dark night to find his army when he accidentally finds himself trawling through just one such field of putrefying meat. He writes, I had not gone far when I suddenly tumbled headlong into a wide ditch. Rising to my feet again, I was startled to find that I had fallen over some corpses. Then the dismal fact dawned upon my mind. I had missed my way and was lost lost among the battlefield of the dead. The sickening odor that rose from the bodies I had unwittingly disturbed by my fall proved that they had been dead some time. The men had no doubt fallen early in the day when we were hurried from our reserve position. And so the soldier gets up, he carries through the field, and attempting to find some familiar ground, he continues. It was my first experience of a deserted battlefield in the darkness of the night, and though not easily cowed, I became possessed by a feeling of nameless horror at being thus compelled, as it were, to keep unwilling companionship with the dead. Danger might be faced, indeed, would have been welcomed as a relief, but the feeling that I could not escape from this labyrinth of death was indeed an awful sensation. Once I tumbled at full length over two bodies, my horror increased at finding my face close to the swollen and bloody features of the dead man who lay uppermost. The corpses seemed to be everywhere, for at times I could not put my foot to the ground without feeling some portion of a man's body beneath it. Turn where I would, I found myself surrounded by these revolting evidences of man's hatred and strife. My head grew dizzy and a feeling of sickness crept over me as I staggered over the ground, carpeted as it were, with the slain of both armies. Though these bodies could be but dimly seen in the darkness, I fancied the glazed eyes of the dead were leering at me. Interspersed through that account are numerous recollections of specific and particularly affecting corpses, including of men lying, embracing one another before death, a large section of, he thinks, 50 or 60 men who apparently died collectively to a canister shot, and of a young drummer boy whose corpse sat hugging his drum, both legs having been shattered by round shot. No amount of triumphal music or jingoistic speeches can make that an adventure. And that is because no matter how it's gussied up with fancy uniforms, no matter how righteous its cause, no matter the means with which it was fought, be it sword and spear or tomahawk missiles, the very core of war is always the same. It's always death, privation, trauma, pain, and suffering. War is hell, no matter the era. Until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants. I thank you all for your time and remember that this video is only one small part of a massive collaboration with eight other YouTube channels, all focused on themes of privation, trauma, and the overall unpleasantness of warfare throughout history. So please, when you are able, take some time to prowl through that playlist linked down below and see if any of them are of interest to you. Everyone there has done a fantastic job. They're all very interesting variations on the theme. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed all the videos and I'm sure that you all will as well. And also remember, of course, to visit nativeoak.org shop where you'll find both variants of that new Bunker Hill poster. It's a great way to support a great artist and, of course, myself. And thank you all for watching, most particularly to these noble persons so listed on your screen. Now, I realize I may have pointed the wrong way. I'm not sure where the credits are going to be, but either way, they're being listed right now. They are very noble indeed, for they are supporting my work on Patreon, and they are the means by which I am capable of carrying out my work. So to all of them, thank you to all of you for watching. Again, thank you very much.